So I think these type of things are very, very important to pay attention to. And that's why, okay, I'm here to represent Collectair, and I, have, I am a fan of Collectair because it includes the user. The user uses the platform, owns the platform, but at the same time can be used top down. So I wonder if it's a possibility to link those type of things in a way that the semantics becomes the bridge and allows for less of the misunderstandings and disruption in terms of concepts, which are potential killers of this platform, on my view. Sorry that it was not a yes or no. None of these questions are actually yes or no, but I think it's a really important point, and it is one of the risks as we see a proliferation of platforms that can actually create more confusion rather than better understanding around the data. But I think one of the challenges we face with Google Forest Watch is that the data we're trying to communicate is fundamentally extremely complex. And we don't want to lose the users and the complexities too. So it ends up being a compromise between complete honesty about what the data is saying and, and the best way to communicate it so people can actually use it and derive value from it. Um, I wonder if I could provoke anyone who, it looks like we had a, a one or two voters in the disagree category to <coughs> explain their thought process. What risk do you see? <laughs> or if you don't feel comfortable and maybe it's someone online, um, do you have any? Oh, yes, go ahead. I, I actually agree, but um, I do see the same risk you have when it comes to any data, which is manipulation. Um, and especially when you talk about satellite data, um, while the data is becoming increasingly freely available. The expectation, uh, the expectation that data is usable right off the bat, uh, I think, still pervades. Uh, whereas, in fact, there is quite a significant investment that's required in order to make data usable, uh, which I think is a barrier to transparency um, and also provides an opportunity for some of those who may wish to misuse the data uh, to take the data that's being applied and they tell their own story. Thank you. And one more question, and then I'm going to turn to the panel. I also generally agree. Um, one concern, though, that's often struck me is that there are significant economies of scale with transparency. And so if we're trying to move towards a more sustainable land use system, there's a risk that by mandating transparency or having and differentiation of products based on transparency, we might be favoring certain actors and making it harder for smallholders or people with fewer resources to participate. Thanks. Uh, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to see to see this this level of, a, of agreement. And there was a there was a session earlier, which I won't their attempt to, to recreate, which, which looked into some of the risks of this kind of radical transparency. Um, and there was a very rich, rich conversation there. When we launched the platform, as uh, so a that many of you will know, um, made the reflection that everything that cannot not be made transparent should be made transparent, and that ultimately this will benefit all actors and benefit good actors in, in particular. And I think, I, I think yeah, that ultimately is really important. We just have to recognize that this will be a transition, a, a, a road, a pathway to um, a better set of outcomes if, if the information is, is out there and available. And someone mentioned stories and how data can be used and manipulated. And I think a lot of this is both about incentives in, in certain jurisdictions to encourage um, actors to stay and make places better, and those incentives need to be aligned in part using this kind of information. But without going there, which relies on, on governance, and is, is if, if you like, outside the, the remit or the, the control of these kind of initiatives, I think what these kind of initiatives can do is to ensure that there are clear narratives um, about not just risks in certain places, but opportunities. Can we highlight the places where there are issues, there may be deforestation or other environmental and social impacts today, um, but where there are, there are the conditions that enable improvements, and to make that information just as available and clearly pulled out as the information 
on risks and also to, um, I mean, thinking of the, the, the trace data, if you're talking about I mean, one of the advantages is the wall-to-wall -wall coverage um, that the trace data um, allows. So you're looking at the entire soy, um, the entire set of soy exports in one year, in fact, in multiple years, and this is, this is critical, um, from Brazil. So if we see over multiple years actors moving from inverted commas, bad places to safe places, then ultimately that should, in the narrative, that should be seen not as a success because they're cleaning up their supply chains, but as a failure because overall um, we're not improving and not getting to where we need to be. And, and I think analyses, you know, more advanced analyses on on leakage and trying to get an evidence base behind behind um, the dynamics of, of, of leakage can shed a new light on what actually constitutes um, success in this game, and that should change the incentives, um, not just at a jurisdictional level, but also for, for, for governments. But it's a, it's, a, it's a road that we're on, and ultimately I think we'll end up in a better place. Does any of the other panelists want to comment on this question? I think we're going to move on to the next. So again, these are imperfect questions, but they're really just meant to, to spark the conversation. So looking across the suite of tools you saw today, which audience do you think has the greatest potential to positively influence land use outcomes through the use of these technology tools? And I know you'd all like there to be an answer that says all of the above, but it's not going to be an option. questions or comments from the audience on this? Why did you vote for the audience that you voted for? Um, it's, it's kind of related to this and the other question, but the topic I feel, um, I do support all of these transparency stuff, and you know, the company I work for, we've got one and we're using it for management tool, but within supply chains for private companies. I can see a great use for private sector having transparency over their supply and being clear in their own management and decision making. I can see it being very useful for advocacy groups. My issue is it feels very big brotherish. Like everybody in this room is, is everybody from the Western world snooping in on all the producer countries and seeing what they're doing. And I can see that, yes, if you're a private company, you need to know what you're doing. But I do feel just slightly nervous about this, that where are the local governments and do they really want this level of transparency? Does the uh, Kalimantan governor really want everybody sitting back in Washington knowing what it's doing? You know, would we allow this to happen in the UK on our sort of farming lands? I'm not sure. So I, don't, I just wonder about the ownership and the, the role we're playing whilst I agree with it kind of thing. That's a really interesting point, and I would like to hear some of our panelists comment on that. In, in our case, what I just presented, I have to say that, and I wanted to say it, but now you're reminding me it has no legal basis whatsoever, just yet, in the sense that it's not being endorsed by the Indonesian government, for example. Um, but obviously, since we're putting in government data, these concessions will be also got company names and so on, and it's, it's it's obviously necessarily comfortable with, but um, you have to know that this is not just a Western thing. I mean, if you if we take the Indonesian example, there are a lot of grassroots movements, uh, local national NGOs who are doing the, exactly the same thing, and um, so um, and who believe that this you know um, these kinds of systems will be able to move things forward. In the case of Indonesia, there's a, all sorts of overlapping land claims. I mean. If you take a concession polygon, there's anything going on in there. There's companies can be present, can operate, but there also might be also all sorts of different actors. Um, uh, there are disputes over land. So bringing in the transparency on all these issues 
might also be a way to solve um, um, land tenure issues. Uh, we're thinking of uh, the One Map Initiative, for example, in Indonesia that tries to do justice and it needs to go transparent in order to be able to, be able to, to move forward because people need to be able to see um, you know, each parcel of land, who does it belong to, and if it's got different claims, then you know, who are, where are all these claims? So I think, yes, um, it looks big brotherish, um, because it comes from the satellites, but um, I think there's a lot of grassroots movements in the country too, that are adopting these systems. Yeah, I think I have one more question in the audience, but I also just want to reflect back on the point that Maria was making earlier, that these platforms really need to be a launching point for transparency to be both top down and bottom up. Uh, and I'm hoping that many of these tools, because they are open source and because the creators of the tools are working with stakeholders at the local level to incorporate information, that we can actually drive this virtuous cycle of transparency uh, through open information. But transparency itself is fundamentally uncomfortable. I think that's <laughs> the nature of what, what we do. Uh, this is Andrew Mitchell, I'm the founder of GCP, and I think there are two very important points that we're just exploring here. Let me deal with the uncomfortable part. I, I think this is a real risk. Um, if you look at what has happened to IPOP, uh, being taken down, whichever way you look at it, um, <clears throat> and the reason it happened to some extent is that it pushes a whole bunch of people into what we might call in England the naughty corner, mm -hmm. and they don't like it. And often those are the people who have the ear of the government, mm -hmm. and therefore they say, get rid of these guys. And uh, transparency systems could fall into that trap uh, as well because it actually favors big companies that can afford to put in the checks and balances and apply the high standards, and it disadvantages the smallholders who can't. That's not a good political position for any government to be in. And, and we do need to figure out how to deal with that. So I think that's a really important point uh, that someone made earlier. Secondly, I think um, we're quite wrong on the boat. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, reputational risk that works in one sector, which is really Western companies that are in Europe. If you actually look at the data, uh, only 7% of the biggest people in the deforestation economy have made any kind of commitment across all their commodities. Only 7%. Um, they have single commodity commitments that are much larger. You can get this data from the Forest 500 website. Now, this is the companies, I guess that's what we mean. But the guys who can really is the financial sector. And I've been demonstrating trace to investors who have holdings in these companies. And they said, yeah, I'd like in Singapore, for instance, um, we hate Hayes in Singapore. We're really upset about it. Uh, we want, you know, they're investing in half the companies that are causing the Hayes. And they don't know which. And they don't know who's good and who's bad. So it's really useful for investors. These kinds of traceability tools will give them a way to engage with companies. And of course, they own them. So I think you should have that. Thank you. Uh, one more comment from the back. Hi, uh, Chris Spotsford uh, from ABM Capital and TLFF. Um, the other that I popped in there down the bottom, I think that's mine anyway, is uh, smallholders. And for example, in the palm oil sector in Indonesia, there's about 4 million smallholders. And what we've seen is that they would welcome a lot of this technology because it links them into, into the world. And at the moment, you know, they're exploited by all sorts of middlemen. They're, they're sold bad seeds. Um, they don't know which bits of land they should be settling on. They're told go over there, burn that forest if you want a bit of money to pay for your child's hospital bill. That's what's going on. That's a lot of a cause of a lot of the problems going on in Kalimantan and other areas. Uh, this allows them to get out of it. We can make it clear finances available if you're in these areas. If you go to these areas, you're in high conservation value forests. It gives a lot of definition to their lives and it brings them into, into the world in a way that otherwise would be hugely expensive. It's also, if you look at the cost of, of getting to transparency or getting to RSPO or GAPKI or, or one of the other different levels that one's got of certification, it's really expensive. This technology is going to bring down the cost and that's really going to benefit smallholders. So my vote, smallholder. Thanks. I think that was at least three comments that we heard about the need to emphasize technology access and incorporation of smallholders. I would just like to emphasize that all the technologies we demonstrated today were either launched in the last week or in the last couple of years. So we really are in nascent stages, and I think one of our biggest challenges is going to be to figure out how we bring these technologies to scale on a very local level. I think we should move on to the next 
question, which I think is the, is the satellite imagery question. Right. So we saw a really exciting presentation from Joe about the potential of microsatellites to bring much higher resolution and higher cadence imagery to our work. And the big question that I ask myself on a regular basis working at Global Forest Watch is, we're going to have this amazing resource. We have limited resources with which to try to translate that into something useful. Where should we prioritize our efforts? Um, so I don't have another category here, but we have a few categories of land use monitoring, generating activity data, uh, monitoring restoration, carbon stock enhancements, monitoring degradation. <laughs> Assessing accuracy of monitoring products derived from medium resolution imagery, like the <coughs> Forest Watch. And also, um, are we missing one at the bottom? There's, um, so the, at the very bottom we have, we don't need it. The medium resolution we have that is freely available is good enough. And there was supposed to be one more answer that had to do with, um, that it would be cost prohibitive, so this question doesn't matter anyway. Hopefully that's better. So maybe at this point, if there are any specific questions for Joe about the applications of this data or your request to Joe about where we should be investing and applying this data first. Thank you, my name is Rana Paul, and I voted for the second one, this accuracy, and uh, I would like to refer what uh, Maria said about transparency and also the first uh, presentation of Nancy, uh, the quality of the data. And I remember last year, um, that was the FRA 2015, they said the global net deforestation is 7.8 million hectares, and uh, Global Forest Watch say 18 million hectare. And uh, this is very confusing, and I think we need really much more information about uh, the accuracy. And because the politicians and decision makers, they are completely confused which figures is now correct. And all, uh, most others are comparing Apple and Pia, but uh, I think we need more information. I think that's, that's the big problem we are facing. I mean, these answers are reflecting the fact that we are in the very early stages, which people see as a very narrow use of it, of the data. I think the data has much more potential than that. And by by having this type of problems in the future, we will worry what is wrong. <coughs> and probably uh, Pra is not uh, as wrong as uh, everyone thinks. So uh, what's the problem? Yeah. And the problem is, uh, is the semantics where uh, those concepts come from. So we need to find easy bridges to understand where the discrepancies are coming from. I mean, we don't have to treat um, public uh, and uh, policy makers like idiots. They are not idiots. They, they, they have their objectives. And uh, what they have to understand is where the discrepancies are coming from. We don't need to make an effort to uh, uh, engineer uh, this, this data to be uh, the same. What we need is made them a mature, uh, solid explanation of why. And it's not easy. I'm agree, it's, it's not easy. But sometimes just saying the Hansen data set is tree cover, which is a very clear concept, right? While when you have uh, data coming from FRA, they use the forest definitions that are being provided by uh, the country, which makes a difference. And there are reasons for having forest definitions and there are reasons for having a common definition to have a global assessment. So this is the sort of things that uh, we have to convey to our policy makers. And I, I, I'm very convinced that uh, there you could expand more than 100 bars here of the use of this data. And if you succeed to do, to, to, do, to do so, then technology will matter, and then all this data which are, we are collecting, it will matter. No? I mean, I, I was I was very happy to see, for example, the trading, and one of the one of the uses which was missing in the former question is the scientific community. The scientific community is also extremely confused, 
and they are also using a whole bunch of models, and they're using a whole bunch of assumptions which are not transparent, right? So the generation of these data sets being used more wisely by scientific community can also help transparency a lot and help to understand where the discrepancies are coming from. And just to add to Maria's point, uh, our Global Force Watch team a couple months ago published a blog directly related to this, um, the differences between GFW and FRA for this exact reason, because we know that lots of confusion is uh, out there in the world. Just very quickly on, on this, I think this is an excellent question. Um, I think, I, I'm actually optimistic that a lot of these technologies will pay enormous benefit in the very near future, culturally and scientifically rigid. Um, you're gonna be waiting a long time. And the main reason for that is simply that uh, the word forest itself is not a standardized scientific concept. Um, you can put labels on it, but those labels behave differently in different biomes. When I was a postdoc, we worked briefly on a data set from spiny forests in Madagascar. Um, I know them by their other name, deserts. <laughs> um, so, um, what, but what I would say is that we actually have a unique and important opportunity to get more accurate about carbon. And the reason we can do that is because carbon, unlike forests, is a, is a uh, element on a periodic table. It cannot, you know, what is a unit of carbon in the abstract cannot be argued about, except by chemists, possibly, or <laughs> physicists. But among, among ecologists and, and NGOs and, and social, uh, civil society actors and governments and so forth, carbon is carbon. Now, it is hard to measure, admittedly, but I think we're getting a lot better at it. And I think, actually, uh, I was disappointed to see few votes for forest degradation, only because there's a huge amount of carbon emissions coming out of tropical forests caused by degradation, and we actually don't have it really any idea what they are. Very few red projects at all look at degradation. And those that are trying to look at degradation are doing it by torturing these 30 meter Landsat pixels and trying to dig around inside and figure out, you know, what's happening you know, within this, this spectral indicator when a single three meter uh, a flash of soil appears briefly and is detected by Landsat in this, but subsumed in this whole landscape. Um, I think, in my opinion, one of the most immediate benefits of more high-resolution data is tracking degradation. And in planet data, for example, but also in the data of other commercial providers that image in high resolution, degradation is as visible as deforestation. <coughs> Logging roads, single tree removals, because you see the soil appear, you see the canopy loss, um, and, and those things happen, and if they're monitored in, in relatively rapid time, you can see them before the forest has a chance to green over and obscure them. And that's a risk with landscape-based analysis as well. Places like Kalamantan, you know, a lot of these logging roads can grow over. And although they're sometimes visible, they're not always as visible as they once were. Thanks. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, and we only got through half of the questions that we had planned. Uh, but I think I would just close with the point that Obviously, there's a lot of very exciting opportunities related to these emerging technologies. We still have a lot of work on our hands to figure out how we create radical transparency, but also responsible transparency, and that we're really creating benefit towards the common objectives that we're here at this landscape forum to address. So I'm going to officially close the session, because I know some people are probably hungry want to get to lunch. But if you still have burning questions, I think the panelists are probably willing to stay an extra few minutes in this room. Um, so we're, we're happy to continue the discussion for a few more minutes. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.